Hi, I'm Noah Feldman. I'm the author of a book called Scorpions, which I'm uh, hoping you're going to read. And that book is about the Supreme Court in a moment very similar to our world today, a moment where the country was in a deep crisis, where the Constitution and the system of government needed to be changed in fundamental ways to improve things, and in which the President of the United States, then Franklin Roosevelt, took huge risks in choosing the right people to do the job. Those people were very different than the people that we typically see going on the Supreme Court today. Today, safety is always the most important concern. Can the nominee be gotten through the Senate? But 60 or 70 years ago, when President Roosevelt decided it was time to take risks, he chose people who were much more flawed, much more complex, and ultimately much greater than many of the justices that we see in our present world. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the people who occupy this story and why I think they matter. To give you one example, Hugo Black, a justice who was appointed by President Roosevelt from the Senate, had been a lifelong politician, and in fact, had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan, a fact that was hidden when he was confirmed, astonishingly enough, you can't imagine that today, and once he was confirmed, it was revealed almost instantly. But instead of resigning in the face of this terrible revelation, he went on the radio, made a speech saying, it's true I was a member of the Klan. I don't apologize for it, but some of my best friends, he said, are Jews, kind of a terrible phrase, and some of my friends are black. And then after this rather shocking display, he just went right back onto the bench. What happened next? Hugo Black, former Klansman, became the most committed racial liberal, the most important person on the court pressing for equality in the history of the Supreme Court to that date. And when the time came for the Supreme Court to decide Brown against Board of Education, the famous desegregation case, it was Hugo Black who told his friends and colleagues on the court, listen to me, I know the South, I know there will be massive resistance to this decision, and it doesn't matter. I have the credibility to tell you that we need to go forward and to do this. So you see there is a story of someone with a terrible, terrible skeleton in his closet, someone who did something really horrible, joining the Ku Klux Klan in order to get elected to the United States Senate, who redeemed himself precisely by staying in public life instead of stepping down or being disqualified. Or take another character who's central to my book, William O. Douglas, one of the most important figures in early environmentalism, a justice who was deeply political, who wanted badly to be president of the United States, who was almost vice president in 1940 and came within a hair's breadth of becoming vice president in 1944, which would have propelled him to the presidency when FDR died. Here was someone whose ambition was so enormous that his colleagues couldn't stand him and they believed that everything he did on the Supreme Court was designed to make him president. And yet, he overcame this tremendous handicap as a justice, namely wanting to get off the court, only after his own personal life completely collapsed. He left his wife and then got married again and again and again for a total of four times. And as a matter of fact, he cheated extensively on even his fourth wife. Uh, so as you can see, he didn't really have a stopping place in this uh, this personal crisis he, was found, he found himself in. And yet, precisely through his rather disastrous personal life, he discovered the key to what would make him a great justice, because he came to believe that the purpose of the Constitution was to expand individual freedom and individual rights. Now, he did that because in his own troubled inner life, he was seeking inner fulfillment and inner peace, something, in fact, I think it's fair to say he never found. And yet, through this search, he was able to generate the constitutional philosophy that has given us many of our most basic individual liberties that we rely on today. Again, it's a story of a flawed person, deeply flawed person, who was also a great person by virtue of his breadth and his experience. The third justice who's central to our story is Felix Frankfurter, who went from being the most famous and prominent liberal probably in the entire United States to being perceived as the most serious conservative on the Supreme Court he believed he had never moved at all. He was so confident himself, so arrogant, his colleagues said, so inclined as a former professor to lecture at them, that they came to detest him and believe that he was always trying to manipulate them to new results. He ended his life with no friends at all. The liberals thought he had abandoned them. The conservatives never fully embraced him. And yet, in retrospect, it's clear that he was the most influential Supreme Court justice for modern conservatives in American constitutional history and an absolutely central figure. My fourth character, Justice Robert Jackson, is in some ways the most enigmatic of all. He was a man profoundly driven by the ambition at all times to make a mark on history. And it drove him to some wonderful things, like taking a year off of the Supreme Court 
to go to Nuremberg and prosecute the Nazis in the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal. At the same time, though, his ambition was destructive to his character and led him to huge frustration and national embarrassment when he was blocked from his attempt to become Chief Justice of the United States. And he really exploded, collapsed, melted down in a spectacular and public way that ultimately tarnished his reputation, despite the fact that he did achieve those great goals of having an impact on history. The men I'm describing began as friends and allies. But once they were put on the Supreme Court, their personalities were so big, their ambitions so enormous, their desire to leave their mark on the Constitution so huge, that they eventually began to become enemies. And when Franklin Roosevelt, their ally, died, there was nobody to rein them in, and they began to attack each other. And that's why, actually, I called this book Scorpions, after an expression that one of their law clerks came up with and that subsequently became famous, the Supreme Court is nine scorpions in a bottle. Nine strong personalities, four of them described in this book, stuck in the same building, engaged in the same job, each trying to leave their mark, end up turning on each other. But what's extraordinary about these four men is that notwithstanding the fact they couldn't work together as a team, they produced through their mutual hatreds some of the greatest and most important developments in the history of our country and in the history of our Constitution. And they were able to do it precisely because they wanted to prove to each other that they were smarter, that they were more influential, that they could do a better job of saving the country. There are times when working as a team is a good thing, but there are times, and constitutional interpretation is one of them, when competing visions have to emerge. And mutual hatred can actually be a spur to greatness if you start with the right raw materials, if you start with people who are smart, who are self-made, who are broad in their interests and in their experiences, and who have, yes, huge ambition. In today's world, it's not clear that we can get people like that anywhere in our government, much less on the Supreme Court. I think we're the poorer for it. So in this book, I try to tell a story of a world in which that was still possible. And I hope that, we're, uh, that through the story, it'll be possible for us to imagine what it would be like to live in that world again today. So that's the story of the book, and I really hope you'll enjoy reading it.